Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much for joining us for today's web webinar on what to expect from the most active FTC in a generation, how to engage with it, how to stay out of its enforcement crosshairs. I'm joined by my, I, I, my name is Reed Freeman. I'm a partner in the e-commerce privacy uh, and cybersecurity group at, at Venable. I'm here with my colleague, Chelsea Brackle, uh, uh, another uh, lawyer in the e-commerce uh, privacy and cybersecurity group. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Okay, so today we're going to uh, we'll do a little, little introduction and talk about, which we just did, to talk about the FTC commissioners. Uh, talk about a significant Supreme Court case uh, that limited the FTC's ability uh, to seek certain remedies. We'll talk about how the FTC is doing that and what their current remedies are. Um, talk, we'll talk about the open commission meetings uh, and then go into the anatomy of an FTC investigation with some practical tips and wind up with new legislation. So. Let's begin and go to slide five. So the chair of the FTC is Lena Khan. Uh, she uh, was sworn in on June 15th, 2021, and has been uh, at a dead sprint since then. Um, prior to that, she was a professor, uh, associate professor at Columbia. Uh, she actually graduated from Yale Law in 2017, uh, but uh, had significant work experience before that um, on the, in, in the Congress on the U.S. House Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust Commercial Administrative Law. Uh, prior to that, she was a legal advisor to FTC Commissioner Rohe. Chopra, who is now uh, the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, and she's written extensively in the antitrust spaces, I'm sure you've heard. Uh, but she's also been described as a, a privacy hawk who's called for um, clear prohibitions and economic disincentives rather than uh, morally laden. Uh, standards uh, such as notice and choice, which uh, she and uh, Commissioner Slaughter are, um, uh, I would say, not enamored with and would like to move away from. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, We, okay, there we go. Um, There's a bit of lag on this. Yeah, okay, that's all right. Um, so uh, Lena Khan is famous, made, made her name writing a paper about uh, antitrust and being antitrust law being lagging behind um, and needing a, a vigorous update uh, and uh, particularly with respect to large um, uh, tech platforms. Uh, but uh, she also co-authored a paper where she just said it's implausible that a big tech company that makes money from online behavioral advertising could ever put users' privacy first. So that's that's um, quite, a, quite a statement uh, and lets you know where she's coming from when it comes to uh, use of data for targeted advertising. So we can move to the next slide. By the way, while we're waiting, I'll also just say the FTC is uh, is comprised of um, five commissioners that are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Um, there are three uh, commissioners in the president's party and two in the uh, minority party. So right now, um, while we're waiting for um, a new uh, commissioner, we're two to two. Uh, but we should have a new commissioner, a Democrat, confirmed soon, as I'll get to in a minute. Uh, Noah Phillips is one of the two Republicans 
Um, he is a uh, um, uh, believes in in markets and uh, and uh, I think is notable when asked how regulators should super supervise innovative technology. Uh, he responded only if necessary and then very carefully. Uh, so that's a, a, a big difference from uh, uh, the Chair Khan. So we can move to uh, Rebecca Slaughter. I can just start talking while we're waiting for the slide to pull up. Um, uh, Rebecca Slaughter was acting chair um, when President Biden was um, uh, was sworn in as president and before Lena Khan was put on the commission. Uh, in fact, Lena Khan was put on the commission and at the very last minute, uh, she was made chair, uh, which surprised a lot of people. Um, uh, Rebecca Slaughter has been um, at the FTC since 2018. Uh, uh, before that, uh, she served as chief counsel to Chuck Schumer and, uh, and, and had a, a private law career before that. Uh, she gave a, a closing speech at the IAPP, um, International Association of Privacy Professionals, um, Privacy Security Risk uh, show in, a couple of weeks ago where she uh, outlined what she thought the FTC should be uh, doing. And uh, among that is uh, moving away from notice and choice and moving towards uh, prohibited conduct, um, moving away from targeted advertising to contextual advertising, or perhaps you know, very, very, very highly um, uh, or broadly targeted advertising, not, not specific. She refers to uh, the internet now as a surveillance society and um, a surveillance economy. Um, she believes like uh, Chair Khan in the dual commission of competition and consumer protection and believes they're interconnected and, uh, and that um, the FTC should uh, uh, work all together, the antitrust folks and the Bureau of Competition and the Consumer Protection folks and the Bureau of Consumer Protection, um, which is, has not been the case previously. Um, and, um, and she also believes that the FTC should not be hamstrung while waiting for a federal privacy law, but rather should move forward to um, uh, uh, substantive rulemakings regarding uh, privacy and, and other things. Uh, we can move on to the other Republican, uh, Christine Wilson. Um, uh, Christine Wilson was sworn in in 2018. Um, she previously served as uh, the uh, uh, prior chairman's chief of staff, Tim Muris, um, and she is uh, an advocate for federal privacy legislation. I'll just say this, the, the FTC now is uh, more polarized than it has been in my entire career since I was there starting in 1996. Uh, we're normally, in normal times, the FTC is a, uh, it, it, most votes are five zero. Uh, there may be a concurrence. Uh, most votes now are three to two. And, um, and there seems to be some tension uh, between the majority party and the minority party. Now, the next uh, uh, Democrat, the third Democrat has been nominated, uh, uh, Alvaro uh, Bedoya um, to take Rohit Chopra's spot on the FTC. Um, uh, he's at Georgetown working on privacy issues. Before that, he was chief counsel uh, of the U.S. Senate Judiciary uh, Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law. Uh, he's a critic of surveillance software, uh, and he is um, uh, a critical of algorithms and the bias that is in, uh, um, a potential a byproduct of, of algorithmic uh, uh, computing, and also uh, is a is a, a real critic of 
uh, facial recognition technology. So we can move to the next slide, which is just a, uh, a chart uh, that shows you what, uh, what the FTC's, you know, it's the org chart of the FTC. So you have what you have the commissioners at the top. Um, there are five commissioners, one, one back. Um, there are five commissioners at the top. They set policy. And um, below that, uh, in the Bureau of Consumer Protection, it says acting director Sam Levine. He was just made uh, um, director, uh, parent director uh, a week or so ago. And he was the attorney advisor for Rohit Chopra and more on that later, but that's a significant development. If you move all the way over um, under the Bureau of Consumer Protection, there's advertising practices, um, uh, business education, um, the division of, um, of um, uh, consumer response, division enforcement, financial practices, um, uh, litigation technology and analysis, marketing practices that deals with fraud, uh, litigation technology and analysis is what used to be the bureau. Uh, it was well, actually a new a new bureau. And then over here, all the way on the far right, is the division of privacy and identity protection. So the associate director of the division of privacy um, uh, and identity protection uh, reports up ultimately to the director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection who reports to the uh, to the commission itself. And now we can move to the next slide and talk about the Supreme Court case. All right, thanks very much, Reed. Apologies, all on the lag of the slides here. We're trying to get that worked out right now. Um, but moving to AMG Capital Management versus the FTC. So this was a landmark case that happened earlier this year. This was April 22nd. Um, and this was a case that shook the FTC up quite a bit. Uh, this came from a complaint filed from the FTC against a company for alleged deceptive payday practices. And what the courts looked at in this was the Section 13B authority under the FTC Act. So the Section 13 authority that the FTC has been re relying on under the FTC Act authorizes permanent injunctions. So the FTC had been interpreting this to allow for equitable monetary relief, such as restitution and disgorgement. So this went through the courts, the district court and the Ninth Circuit relied on Section 13B's authority to say that the FTC was able to get these remedies through that provision. And then when it got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court unanimously held that Section 13B does not authorize the FTC uh, to seek monetary relief uh, like the disgorgement and restitution. So instead, what they have to do to obtain equitable monetary relief is that the FTC has to follow the process set forth in Section 5 in section 19 of the act. So this is a little bit more burdensome on the FTC and this would require the agency to first obtain a cease and desist order um, in administrative proceedings among other things. So that is the punchline of it and how this even came to be was that over the years, they, the FTC only had administrative enforcement power and this was interpreted more broadly and more broadly and courts were enforcing it. And so it just became a tool that the FTC relied on over the years. Um, so with this ruling, it's a big ruling because obviously they can't get monetary relief in the same way. Uh, and the FTC has been able to get quite a bit of monetary relief through the years through this provision. Um, so what happens now that they can't use this? Well, it may be a short-lived change because as we're going to talk about, there's been some legislation introduced to expressly give them this authority. Um, notably, just this past week, the Republicans introduced new legislation uh, that would address this. And then earlier in the year, the Democrats had introduced legislation as well. 
Reed, did you have, you looked like you were had something on that? Or we can move. Just briefly say that the, the 13B authority that was taken away uh, started in, in 1982. The FTC took the position in a fraud case that uh, if the statute said uh, the FTC can seek a permanent injunction, that by dint of that, the FTC had the authority to invoke, um, well, the court uh, could invoke its full equitable powers to get to the permanent injunction. That way they could get an asset freeze, a TRO, and a fraud case, um, and, and restitution, and all the other equitable remedies. And it was the Supreme Court that said, no, we're reading the plain language of the act. It says permanent injunction, and that's all you can get. So that, that's, that's how we got there. Great, thanks Reed. So now Reed's gonna talk about some of the monetary remedies. Post. So, uh, so this, this there, there's a number of ways the FTC can seek monetary relief that are unaffected by this decision. Um, if there is a prior cease and desist order um, uh, and a company violates it, uh, even a consent order, the FTC can seek and obtain civil penalties. Uh, they've been very active in that in that sphere. Um, uh, if there is a trade regulation rule, like the telemarketing sales rule or can spam or or one of those, the the FTC uh, is authorized to seek civil penalties under a trade regulation rule. And then uh, there's this process authorized by Section 19 of the FTC Act, which the FTC has not used uh, or has used only once in the past 20 years because they've, they've been relying on 13B uh, to get, to get uh, monetary relief. So let's go to the next slide and talk about that. Okay, so Section 19 of the FTC Act is not a not a, um, a, a not the most elegantly drafted provision of law, um, and it's a little bit confusing. And prior to the FTC's uh, reliance on it, um, nobody really knew what it meant. But first, uh, if you this says you know, number one. If you violate uh, any rule, we just talked about that, then get civil penalties. If you violate uh, a um, uh, uh, cease and desist order, they get civil penalties for that. Um, and then it says at the end on two words in red, if the commission satisfies the court that the act or practice to which uh, the cease and desist order relates is one, which a reasonable man, now this was drafted in 1914, so that's, that wouldn't be the same person, would have known under the circumstances was dishonest or fraudulent, the court may grant a relief under subsection B. And sub, while we're waiting for the slide to pull up, um, uh, the uh, subsection D, and remember this is something that if a, a reasonable person uh, would have thought was dishonest or fraudulent, the court can grant uh, uh, relief. And that includes rescission, reformation of contracts, the refund of money uh, or return of property payment damages, public notification respecting the rule violation or the unfair or deceptive act or practice. Uh, and, um, and so um, this, this is... Uh, uh, what the FTC is using now, they've been sending out um, score, well, hundreds and hundreds, maybe over a thousand um, notice of penalty offense uh, letters, uh, which puts companies on notice that um, uh, this is what we think um, the law is and what is deceptive and fr or fraudulent. And that is the um, underlying uh, kicker for which they would uh, say that a, a reasonable person would know it's dishonest or fraudulent, they can go straight to civil penalties. Um, the FTC is also 
um, been issuing, um, uh, we can go to the next, to the next slide, uh, more stringent injunctive remedies uh, as well. And uh, these um, uh, are very prescriptive in terms of, in a privacy case, a very prescriptive privacy program, um, uh, data security case, a very prescriptive data security program. Um, and uh, there, uh, several of the commissioners uh, want, you know, said in their dissents that um, they think that individuals ought to be named in most until until recently the the sort of there's nothing there's nothing legal you know, legally requiring this but the FTC has sought uh, to, has named individuals uh, in small closely held companies typically in fraud cases and not in uh, not in connection with um, uh, cases involving um, publicly traded companies. Uh, and uh, now they're they're doing that. And most notably, they did that just last week. Um, and then notice to consumers: this is um, something that that they have done previously, but that the commissioners, the, the majority now, is more um, uh, hawkish on: is that uh, it, in a, if if they you know go to, go to trial and win, or you settle with the FTC and there you end up in an order, um, you have to actually send a notice about what you did and, and uh, the FTC drafts the notice and you're required to send it to um, all of the affected individuals. So notice to consumers is a new um, uh, remedy as well. Uh, well, more commonly used now and, and uh, will be more commonly used by the majority. Um, the FTC has uh, also changed the provisions required in data security orders. Uh, this was under the uh, prior administration. It's only going to get more prescriptive with the current administration. Um, new provisions include employee training, access controls, monitoring systems for data security incidents, patch management systems, and encryption, uh, more rigorous assessments, for third-party accountability, um, so your vendors. Uh, uh, um, uh, this is you know looking looking over your, your vendor's shoulder, and uh, elevated security considerations to the C-suite with annual certifications and presentations to the board, company's board of directors. Great, thanks, Reed. So in addition to what Reed just said, some other observations that we're noticing here are the types of um, issues that the commission's looking at. So facial recognition, AI, algorithmic bias, um, biometrics, all of these issues continue to be important to the commission. These are not um, new just for this new commission, but what we're noticing the difference is is the way that they're going about investigations and the tools that they're using. So the commissioners have said that these are issues that they're going to continue to watch. Um, AI has been an issue for years, but they're now moving forward with exploring it at an even deeper uh, perspective, having hearings, putting up FTC staff blog posts on the issues, more enforcement actions. So it's definitely an area that's starting to heat up. And as part of the omnibus resolutions, uh, the chair also said that they're going to continue to issue letters uh, in this area as well. So the open commission meetings, there's been three so far. The first one started was on July 1st, 2021. This was the most robust as far as privacy and data security provisions um, are. And so, there was a host of omnibus resolutions directing the FTC staff to use compulsory processes such as civil investigative demands and subpoenas to investigate priorities. And the key with this was they said without additional approval from the commission, which is a big change from how these have been going down previously. Um, so a couple of the commissioners, the Republican commissioners mostly, did not like this. 
Um, they cited some of their concerns being that they weren't going to have a cohesive strategy moving forward. They weren't going to see what's going on. They weren't effectively able to do their jobs in understanding what was happening at the FTC and having these investigations um, move forward. And in one case, uh, Commissioner Wilson said she hadn't even seen letters that went out the door to some of these companies, which was not something that had, had previously happened. And then on a similar note, Reed had mentioned the notice of penalty offense letters, um, which there's certainly been a rise in. The last time I was looking at the numbers, as of last month, I think there were 17 pages worth of companies listed that have received these letters so far. This is a new tactic that they're moving forward with. Um, and as Reed touched on, what they're doing in these letters is putting companies on notice of deceptive behavior. And so that way they can bring an action in the future. But the interesting part with these letters is that some of them are very old from the 1950s. Um, you know, technology has changed so much, practices have changed. And to really say that you're on notice, there has to be a very direct correlation in the actions happening um, between that letter and then the alleged violation of the company. So for the amount of letters that have been issued, it will be interesting to see where it goes from there. So far, we have not seen these letters turn into a number of enforcement actions. That has still been quite low. Um, so as far as other priorities that we're seeing, the commission has said that tech platforms, specifically new forms of tech platforms and next generation technologies are going to be a focus. Um, we don't have much more specific on what this is going to mean, uh, but that's just what they've said. Healthcare and pharmaceuticals is going to be an area of focus as well. And I've listed uh, some of the priority targets there, repeat offenders, et cetera. Uh, one thing that's interesting to note about this first commission open meeting was uh, that the commissioners were not really able to talk to each other beforehand. We heard this from some of the staff members that it was more of an organized show um, of how they were going about it and less of an actual discussion on what they wanted the issues to be and how they were going about engaging with each other. Um, because of some of the rules about engaging with the other commissioners. Uh, and one staff member actually made the comment that they were very upset about how this meeting went about because the chair had said it was going to be a take it or leave it approach. They couldn't individually vote on the resolutions. And so that made it very difficult for the commissioners to go one by one. So then there were two more open commission meetings that happened. We had one in July and one in September. And the meeting in September touched on the health breach notification rule, which covers entities who are not covered by HIPAA, um, but may have sensitive health information that have been compromised. And this policy statement addressed additional clarity on scope and ongoing obligations for those entities. And I think there's one additional piece uh, that was running parallel with these commission meetings, and that was the letter issued by the chair. So Chair Khan issued a letter shortly after the first commission meeting where she set out her priorities to the staff. And as part of that letter, she mentioned some of those targets that I just talked about as far as biometrics, algorithmic bias, and dark patterns, which is a technique used to map um, unwanted purchases or convince consumers to have unwanted purchases is how the FTC describes it. But some of the other priorities that she put forward was she said trying to integrate the two divisions. So having the consumer protection and the competition bureaus come together, which is kind of an interesting notion because I think almost every chair has said this is something they want to do over the years. But the way that they're structured, there's just different priorities. Um, each bureau has different remedies that cannot necessarily be uh, reconciled there. And if you think of it from a practical perspective of, you know, the Consumer Protection Bureau may say, yeah, it's a great idea to have all the companies in a room and agree that we are going to do this one practice in the same way. 
Well, competition may say, uh, actually, that's not such a great idea from our perspective. So there's a lot of challenges there, but she has said uh, repeatedly that that's something she wants to do. So it remains to be seen how exactly that can be done. Um, and then another thing that she's mentioned is she really wants to move to the rulemaking and shifting resources to both rulemaking and research. That's an interesting notion as well, considering that the FTC is an enforcement agency and the rulemaking process is quite cumbersome um, and is, is difficult to move forward with. So we're not quite sure what that means as far as allocating staff to maybe doing a research or letters versus focusing on the enforcement and investigation side, uh, but that is something she's put out. So we'll see how that moves forward. All right. So, so the, 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 um, the reason why the FTC's rulemaking authority is uh, cumbersome, it's called Magnuson Moss rulemaking authority. And uh, the reason why uh, the FTC doesn't have Administrative Procedures Act rulemaking authority is because uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, the FTC uh, was uh, issuing uh, a host of rules under the unfairness doctrine, uh, the unfairness prong of, of the F Section 5, um, until they got to one where they banned um, all advertising to children uh, on Saturday mornings. And even the Washington Post uh, called the FTC the national nanny. And uh, Congress stripped the FTC from APA rulemaking authority, stuck them with this very, very cumbersome uh, rulemaking authority, and even stripped their appropriation for 14 years. And the FTC's uh, budget was limited to um, uh, filings for merger, merger filings. So let's move on to the next slide. So this is uh, something you 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 can um, uh, look at uh, down the road. It 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 has uh, somewhat changed over the years. Um, the initiation of an investigation. Um, the sources for FTC actions on the far left side, um, consumer complaints, um, referrals from the, this is a, a NAD is a, as an advertising stuff regulatory forum, competitor complaints, very few competitor complaints result in FTC investigations. Um, but what I think what we're gonna see now is um, consumer complaints um, that fit within the, the um, the agenda of the FTC. So they're gonna, what, what happens is the FTC, the, the commissioner set policy, and then staff works up cases that go up to the commission to vote on. And so um, they've set policy for what they'd like to go after and the staff will look at consumer complaints to work up cases. Um, uh, the the um, investigation is initiated, used to be, access letters and CIDs, a civil investigative demand, which it, we'll get into a minute in this formal process. Uh, they almost always use CIDs uh, now. And uh, if you look to the right for immediate relief, uh, that tends to be um, in fraud cases, like just straightforward fraud cases that could be wire act or mail fraud cases, uh, not privacy cases uh, where they would just come in with a TRO asset freeze and so forth. So um, let's move on to the, the nuts and bolts. So a civil investigative demand is akin to a subpoena. It's a formal administrative process. It's returnable within 30 days of receipt. It includes the e-discovery, just like civil litigation. Um, they call for responses to interrogatories and requests for documents. They be have become over the years bigger, longer, much more um, uh, a burdensome, uh, massive amounts of material. And in particular, uh, because of the multiplicity of communications channels, 
other than what used to be just you know memos or letters. Now you know, there there's email, and then now you have Slack, HipChat, and everything else, and all of that uh, uh, goes into when they call for communications and and is very uh, extensive and time consuming to pull together. Uh, there is a mandatory meet and confer within 14 days of receipt of the CID. Um, at first blush, you might you might think this is an, another uh, uh, burden uh, thrown on you, but it's actually a giant opportunity, um, and it should be seen that way. It's your chance to try to narrow the CID scope and extend the timing of the response. So what what do you do? You you meet with the client right away. You look at the CID um, and what, what, what do we have? What do we not have? What are we not sure about? How hard is it to access the information and documents called for? How many stakeholders need to be interviewed to answer the interrogatories and find and pull all of the documents from all of the various places? So my tip here is after you've met with a client, you create a chart uh, with the information you've learned and propose how the FTC CID can be modified to get the FTC what it needs. You have to convince them that they'll get what they need um, at the least burden and cost to the company. And you leave behind uh, that with the staff because the staff does not have authority to modify the CID. The uh, director of the of uh, the Division of Privacy and Information uh, and identity protection does and in her management. Uh, so so I, I create a chart. I just put um, uh, the, the, the questions on the left side and uh, I maybe call, propose a, a rolling production and just put in if, if uh, um, you know what what we propose to get to the FTC and when. And um, that has proven to be a very successful strategy to narrow a CID. So e-discovery, um, this is very expensive given the FTC's multiple pages of instructions on how to produce electronic materials with all of the metadata in its particular types of format. Um, this plus the, the um, scope of the CIDs in my in my career, have increased the cost of responding uh, to an FTC as an FTC investigation by it says here three x, but I would say three to three to five x. Um, so, what what to do um, to try to reduce the cost, reduce the burden? I mean, actually, you know, your business is not in the business of responding to CIDs. Your business is in the business of <laughs> doing business and you can overwhelm yourself. So you try to identify all the electronic documents and communications before the meet and confer so you know the burden and cost. And then you try to get the document request changed. They'll say all documents referring or relating to. Uh, you try to get it to say documents and communications sufficient to show. Uh, then, then you don't have to find you know, get all the way to the x-axis. They can always come back and ask for more, but this is what you propose as, the, as going in. And then you try to identify all of the stakeholders, and if they're numerous, you try to get the FCC to agree at the meet and confer to producing documents and communications only from the stakeholders most likely to have the documents and communications called for. And that has been a, a productive strategy to try to reduce the cost. Um, uh, now, I mentioned rolling productions. Uh, the FTC will agree or has agreed to rolling productions um, with, but the cost of getting a rolling production is you have to make a production of some kind uh, on the return date. And that's usually uh, a very light production uh, and then, you know, the hardest things go in the last production and, and you know, you get as much as you can into the second production. Um, and sometimes you get to a place where you, you, you realize, you're, you know, there's more 
than you thought, and you have to call the FTC staff and tell them, um, you know, we're going to need to make a, a, a fourth production um, because we've just found this this information, and I've found that if you you know have a good reason why you need to do that, they they will generally agree. Um, now, when you uh, when you make your productions and you answer interrogatories, of course you have to be truthful and uh, complete and and you know accurate. Uh, but you can put a spin on it and put it in a context uh, that is favorable to your client so that it's in, in context. And then at the conclusion of your investigation, you can flip this upside down and consider a white paper that pulls all the information and documents you've produced, which sort of in a defensive way, and um, turn around and argue that this is what we've produced, this is what you've uh, are investigating, and there was no violation of the law or the trade regulation uh, at issue. So then, uh, pre-litigation investigational hearings. Um, this this was something that was typically previously used in fraud cases, and is now used in uh, most cases the FTC is bringing. Um, these are. Uh, akin to depositions, uh, except that they're um, less favorable to the uh, deponent than uh, a civil investigation, a civil litigation deposition. There's a hearing examiner and then uh, uh, the staffer that um, that is doing the, the deposition or the investigational hearing. Well, they guess who the hearing examiner is. It's the other lawyer on the case. And um, there, there are a number of objections in civil litigation to depositions. The only, the only allowable um, um, uh, um, the, the only allowable objection in an investigational hearing is privilege. Now you can call for a break and, um, and if, if it's going poorly and, and um, you know kind of reset with the client with what um, you know, where the FTC is going and what to look out for. But um, the tips are you know, prepare for these like a deposition. Make sure your witness knows the documents and the information issue and is ready for difficult questions. Uh, so you prepare just like a deposition. Um, now, the last case I was on, the FTC um, uh, noticed uh, more than 10 investigational hearings, uh, which you know that the, if you think of the cost of gathering all the documents, preparing and doing the deposition, which can go for more than a day, um, ten or more times, that's a staggering uh, figure. So uh, you really want to try to limit the number of investigational hearings based on the knowledge of the relevant material um, and and uh, or or duplicative knowledge with others, so that you. You don't have two people who know the same thing, both being deposed. Um, and then the final tip here is keep in mind that the witness is entitled to their own counsel of choice. So, um, you know, beware of conflicts. The, the FTC may may uh, decide to, uh, that the witness is um, somebody who should be uh, named in the order. So, uh, one thing I left out. Um, earlier is at the very beginning of uh, when you have your meet and confer, I always ask the staff um, that at the conclusion of our production, um, if you have any remaining questions uh, or comments or concerns uh, that you uh, would agree to meet with me and my client or clients uh, before you make any recommendation uh, uh, in, in either direction uh, to any management, uh, even the lowest level of management. Because once the staff makes a recommendation, um, it, it really is like a snowball rolling downhill. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and harder and harder and harder to stop. So you really, the, the key to getting an, an investigation closed is to try to win the staff over and have the staff advocate on your behalf that 
they um, that their the case should be closed. Um, now, negotiating an order, uh, this is uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, if they want to have an order, they'll send you a, a draft complaint and a proposed order, give you 45 days to negotiate it. If you need more time than that and you're making good progress, they'll usually give you more time for that instead of just suing you. Um, and what you want to do is find all of the relatively recent prior orders that would apply to your matter and um, uh, try your best to distinguish them uh, in another white paper or meetings with the director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection and also uh, with the staff. And then you go up to the director and then you also have a right to meet individually with each of the commissioners uh, before the FTC issues a complaint. So moving on to our last top new legislation. Thanks, Reid. Yeah, so the last point here on new legislation for the FTC. So I touched on earlier that the Republicans just put out a bill and then the Democrats put on the bill I have mentioned here um, back in the summer, which would expressly authorize the FTC to seek monetary relief in federal court, including restitution, which is, of course, in response to the AMG case. Um, and this has been supported by the White House. And so these bills um, not only include those provisions, but they also recommend expanding FTC powers um, in certain areas as well. And then the Build Back Better proposal, which is part of the proposed economic package, proposes a billion dollars with a B billion in funding to create a division for privacy enforcement. So this would be actually a bureau, a, a, a bureau being higher up than a division, just a whole bureau that like the antitrust bureau the kind of competition, the Bureau of Consumer Protection, this would be like a DPA. Yeah, so there's not a ton known about what would happen with this other than there would be expansive funding um, and Chair Khan has not weighed in yet uh, on her views on this as well. I assume she'd probably be uh, in favor of having additional funding, but we don't know from her exactly what the priorities from the FTC would be uh, with this fund. So if that were to come, it would be a big change for the FTC and a lot of resources. Um, so more to come on that. At this point, it's not clear exactly the viability of these bills. Um, the proposals have been out. There's been a lot of discussion on both sides, but at this point, it, there's no clear end point in sight. So on that note, we're going to move to questions. We have just about 10 minutes. So if you want to go ahead and submit questions into the chat, we'll allocate a few minutes for that. 